Well, Jared spoke with me. He asked me to present something on creating a agricultural legacy. And so that's kind of what we have focused these remarks on today. And and part of this, I mean, it is such a broad topic. When you get into all of the different aspects of this with the time allotment that we have, it really is going to be presented in concepts, not details, because there's there's so much detail when you get into the aspects of this different of, of all the different things as far as soil and biology and minerals. And then you get into the microorganism complexes and then you get into plant physiology. It It's a, a week long discussion, not a 45 minute presentation. So with that, remember this is gonna be pretty much in concept, but but I want to try to address the critical parts of what we're actually doing. And so to leave a legacy, a legacy is something transmitted or received from an ancestor or a predecessor or from the past. And to have a legacy requires two things. In this case, it's land. And, and also it requires people. You can't do one without the other. We have to have both. Both land and mankind are being degenerated because we have switched from natural to unnatural processes and products. We've gone from minerals and microbes to synthetic fertilizers. We have traded the work that we do and the learning that goes with it for the ease and simplicity. Our self-management has been given to consultants, agronomists, co-ops, and the simplified concept of NPK. And we have traded our plant health for disease and chemicals. We have traded our quality for quantity with toxicity. And this has sacrificed the health for disease for both land and for mankind. And so we're going to present this in kind of a parallel system. So when you start looking at what has occurred in the third industrial revolution, which is just slightly over a hundred years, we're going to go through just some of the events that has redirected our focus and what are the results of that? So if we just look at agriculture on the top, we, Fritz Haber first synthesized nitrogen in approximately 1910. The NPK concept began being taught in schools around 1924. Our pesticide use began in the 1930s. DDT was introduced around 1940, and we started getting more and more into the tillage and the mechanized part of agriculture because of the Ford and John Deere, which had happened, you know, somewhere around 20 years earlier. But these became more commonplace. Well, in 1974, Monsanto commercializes Roundup. And in the late 90s, you have this first introduction of genetically engineered crops. And, and as we look at that, we can look at the percentage of crops that are now genetically engineered that are a big portion of not only our diets, but also of our landscape and our agricultural soils. Well, if you take the same timeline, and you go back and you begin to look at what's happened to the human experience is prior to 1900s, we had the introduction of cottonseed oil in approximately 1866. In the 1880s, we went from whole grains into refined wheat 
we switched from stone grinding into roller mill technology. And then they began putting in saturated fats with seed oils in an attempt to make a blend of a new margarine. Well, as you go into the 19th century or the 20th century here, you have Procter and Gamble introducing Crisco, the hydrogenated vegetable oils in 1911. The first documented heart attack in the United States was 1912. We begin introducing more synthetic foods in the 40s and in the and in through the 50s. And so what the shift became was to move away from naturally occurring animal fats into different types of oils. You have the high fructose corn syrup coming forth in 1957. And then they, the food industry and the media and the government really began the demonization of saturated fats. And I remember this as a kid where you had this massive media blitz that really focused on getting rid of animal fats out of your diet these saturated monosaturated fats in favor of the new vegetable oils. And that is a misnomer, a misnomer because vegetables do not produce oil. Seeds produce oil. You get the government starting to get involved in this. McGovern and others began pushing this low fat, high carb diet. You have the US dietary guidelines coming in in the 80s with their food pyramid and into the 21st century by 2010, 63% of the US diet is now processed foods where before virtually the entire diet was whole foods. And so what has happened is you have a massive expression in metabolic disease in the human family. And so as we look at this more closely, what you have in degraded soils is the amount of genetically engineered crops. And, and it isn't just the, the crop itself, it's the genetic engineering within the plant, but it's also the fertilizers and the highly toxic chemicals that go with the crops that do such a destructive uh, process to our soil and our soil life and health. So you take sugar beets, 99% genetically engineered. Rice, almost 98% genetically engineered. Cotton, 96. Canola, 95. Soybeans, 95. Corn, 93% genetically engineered that we grow in this country. And alfalfa is rising and it is now at 30%. And so again, you have this massive land exploitation of genetically engineered crops. And as you can see, the NPK concept, the pesticides, the Roundup, all of these things became necessary and, and were put in place prior to this massive genetically engineering experiment. When you look at the number of Americans diagnosed with metabolic disease. Now, here's the concept. You cannot separate land, land use, and human health. They're indescribably connected. And there is no possible way that you can separate one from the other and say that they independent, they operate independently because they emphatically and they cannot. And so if you follow the process of what's happened in the industrial agricultural revolution, look what's happened in the same period of time to the human health revolution. Our current population in the United States is 336 million people. 90% or just over 302 million have metabolic dysfunction. We have 73% are overweight. 
So just under 245,000 or 245 million of our people are overweight. We have at least 60% of our population with one metabolic syndrome, which puts us over 200 million people. 50% of our population has high blood pressure. So we're at about 168 million. 45% of the population has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. 43% of our population is obese. That's about 145 million people. 40% of our population has multiple metabolic syndromes. 38% or almost 128 million people are pre-diabetic. And we have 37% of our population living with cardiovascular disease, over 125 million people. We have 100, we have 18% of our population is severely obese, which is around 26 million people. We have just about 40 million diabetics at 12%, and we have about 5% of the population living with cancer. And so when you look at this system and you go back to a biblical time frame of 6,000 years, we've accomplished this massive decline in human health in just a fraction of the time where we've actually taken something that was in a natural whole state that had supported humanity for millenniums and we have literally destroyed it in approximately one century. And at this rate that we're moving forward on this, our human existence is headed towards an extinction level because we've done the same thing to our soil. And so when you look at what is metabolic syndrome, this is not a short list. This is an extensive list. And as you go through all of these things, these diseases, these disorders, this dysfunction within our metabolic system, we have done this because we've taken that which has been historically sound as whole and natural, and we've adopted the concepts that we can do better with synthetic and unnatural and chemicals and poisons. And this is where it has landed us. And so when you, when you look at our progress, you have to pause and literally say, well, why did we get here? And how did we accomplish this? Well, the first part of this is, what are the rules of nature? What are we ignoring? And what aren't we paying attention to? So when we start talking about nature, I think the best author is we turn to what God has instructed us. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Let there be light, that divine intelligence in all things created by God. There are six creative periods and the laws of reproduction and life are laid out. And it is very clear that man is a steward here. And that is it. We are not the originator. We're not the designer. And we are not the coordinator of all this. There is proper food for our genetic design. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So we're going to look into this a little bit day, deeper. Within the structure of all life, there is a divine intelligent order that governs the physiological laws relating to its structure, its functions, and encompassing all metabolic processes. And now, just pause here. Just as our bodies have all of these metabolic processes, so do our soils, so do our lands, so do our livestocks. 
And so this doesn't apply just to humans or just to animals or to our soils. It applies to everything that we're dealing with here. As we look at this a little bit more in depth, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, as we understand this, this process meant that we are being told by God that matter was brought forth from an or unorganized state. And it was endowed with intelligence to become stable. This light, divine intelligence, gave matter, individual properties. It gave it energy and structure and stability. And these became the building blocks of our Earth, planets, and the stars surrounding it, our entire solar system, because this is what life and intelligence needed to come forth. So as we begin to look at the building blocks of life, these are our basic elements. We we'll find these in our periodic table of elements. And so these each have chemical, physical, and electromagnetic properties, and they're all individually unique. None are like another, and these become the atoms, the elements, or minerals. So as you look at our periodic table of elements, we're up to about 119 elements. But the primordial or the naturally occurring elements are those that we deal with here in agriculture. And they're not only the composition of our soils, they're the composition of all of our plants and they're the composition of our bodies. And so all of these elements have an intelligence and we need to use it in accordance with its designed intelligence. Atoms. It is what is recognized as the smallest particle of an element made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Well, your protons are positively charged. Neutrons, of course, neutral. And electrons are negatively charged. And they're each different. So when you look at the different elements of hydrogen, boron, carbon, nitrogen, manganese, cobalt, copper, zinc, they all have a different atomic number. The protons and electrons always match. Neutrons help make up the various weights because every one of these elements has its own molecular weight as well. So these become the building blocks. This became part of the earth in, in day one. Now, when God created it this way, when we take a soil test and we look at total soil solubility, we can take and what the lab is going to tell us is what is that soluble component of this particular sample? Meaning what extract from this lab is going to pull or solubilize specific minerals? And this is kind of in an attempt to mimic what a plant might be able to do between the plant soil interaction. Well, over and over, the top six inches of your soil is going to range between 2 million and 3 million pounds, depending upon what part of it is sand and what part of it is clay. Sand being the lighter, clay being the heavier. But on this particular soil test, which is very common, we have approximately 13,000 pounds of soluble mineral. But in relation to 2 million pounds of total soluble or, or total soil, total soil in the top six inches of an acre, that's less than 1% soluble. And the reason that God did it this way is so we don't lose it. The vast majority of all of our reserves are insoluble because if they were soluble, the moment that water came, we would lose them. 
So by design, these soils are not overloaded with soluble nutrients. There's a reason for that. And so that's what we're gonna look at next. Day two of creation. This is where we begin to deal with the separation of the waters and the creation of heaven. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And he divided the waters. And what we ended up with was the firmament and the water. And he called the firmament heaven. And that was the end of the second day. Now, day three gets incredibly interesting. And so as we begin to look into day three, let's see what happens. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. We end up with dry land as earth and our waters are called seas. Then God said, bring forth grasses and herbs, yielding seed and fruit trees after their own kind. And it was so. And so the next thing that we think is we have this spontaneous explosion of plant life and beautification of our earth. Now, those are all incredibly great pictures, but let's go back and try to understand actually just what happened. Because God works in natural ways. Now, here's a concept. CO2 is more important to high yield potential than nitrogen or any other element. Now, this is gonna go contrary to what we're taught in agricultural systems. They're gonna tell you nitrogen is the most important thing. Well, I think God has another view. When we look at this, dry plant matter is made up of 45% carbon, 45% oxygen, 6% hydrogen, and up to 1.5% nitrogen. Now, these are atmospheric gases. Our magnesium, potassium, calcium, phosphate, and sulfur reach approximately 2%. And again, God holds these elements in an insoluble form. So a plant simply can't use carbon and it simply can't take up oxygen as O2. It's not possible. It can't take hydrogen up as hydrogen. Can't happen. So what happens next is there has to be a natural process of fixation. And so what combines, what has the capacity to take and combine carbon and oxygen? Well, if you remember, mankind and livestock don't show up until day six. So what was here that created the CO2 conversion? It was biology. Biology was the mechanism millions upon millions of species of bacteria, millions upon millions of species of fungi, in addition to the predator groups of protozoa and nematodes. And who programmed all of those various and individuals and groups of microorganisms? Everyone is programmed with a different genetic design, a different genetic intelligence, and a different genetic function. Now, how long would it take you to program literally millions and tens of millions of microbes? I want you to think about this job. This is a big job. We already have the soil in place. Now we need microorganisms. 
So when you look at the construction of a plant, any plant, and it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if it's a grass, if it's a vine, if it's a tree, this is its composition. And so if we're looking at providing nutrition and building structure and operating this plant, you have 96 to 97 and a half percent that is just atmospheric gases versus two, but not more than 3% that are soil elements. So when you look at the concept of what is the most important to manage, you should have a very high focus on your biology populations, because they're the ones that are doing the majority of the plant construction with CO2. The trace elements represent less than, about approximately half of 1% of your plant's entire dry matter weight. But these are absolutely key because the enzymes that are within the plant or the animal or the human all require trace elements and vitamins as activators. We literally have hundred plus thousand regulatory proteins in our genetic makeup. And every one of those requires either a trace element or a vitamin to activate it so that that intelligence within the enzyme can carry out its design genetic function. And there are no exceptions. And zinc does not substitute for copper. Copper doesn't substitute for boron. Boron doesn't substitute for magnesium. Doesn't happen. And so we need these enzymes in the process of breaking down and putting things back together through enzymatic processes. These trace elements and these vitamins are the drivers. Industrial agriculture would like to tell us, well, you need and you should rely on NPK. And the question is, well, where's the other 97.3% of my plant dry matter going to come from? In the creation of the biological groups, there's an infinite amount of intelligence. And so our types of vegetation, whether they range from weeds, grasses, vegetables, row crops, vines, into our fruit trees, our deciduous trees, conifers, into the old growth cedars. We have a biological balance of bacteria to fungi, which are your plants' companions in the soil. And they're meant to do the solubilizing, whether it's the carbon and oxygen, whether it's the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium, calcium, sulfur, magnesium, trace minerals. They are the plant companions for solubility, for creating nutrition. And this system is incredibly efficient. There is virtually no waste in this system. So whatever type of plant we're growing, it, the critical factors is we get the biology in balance with that plant's genetic and nutrition designs. And so through the big picture of it all, we have insoluble elements that need biology through microbial fixation. And it isn't just bacteria and fungi, it's protozoa and nematode, and we'll talk about that. That creates the plant available nutrition for yield and quality. And so back to this divine intelligence, is everything is composed of carbon to nitrogen ratios. And, and it is that there's not a better mathematician mathematician than God. And so this is going to become evident here as, as we walk through this. Your bacteria, on average, five carbons to one nitrogen. Fungi can be 20 carbons to one nitrogen on up to even higher. Protozoa. 30 to 1, nematode up to 100 to 1, micro macro orthopods 150 to 1. And so, Jared, it's like you and I. Our carbon nitrogen ratio is 30 to 1. 
And so we eat those things that are within or below our ratio. The reason that you and I don't like cardboard is because it has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of probably 400 to one, nor do we like newspaper, but we do like potatoes and we do like steak and we do like apples and oranges. And so we eat those things within our ratios because by our genetic design, we have to maintain these ratios. And there's a great purpose in this. And this is called nutrient cycling. This is how things live without the assistance of CHS or our fertilizer companies or Wilbur Ellis. It's, it's through a biological nutrient cycling process. And so what you have is you have decomposing microbes you also have predatory microbes. And so you have specific microbes that are designed to eat other microbes. And this isn't any different than what occurs in nature. The last I checked, bunnies still got eaten by bears. And that becomes a crucial process in the nutrient cycling. Well, bacteria get eaten by protozoa. But this is what happens because their ratios are different the protozoa doesn't require as dense of nutrition as contained in the bacteria, but it does require the carbons. So in simple math at five to one, if I'm a protozoa, I have to be eating six bacteria to maintain my carbons, but I also get six nitrogen. I can't keep six nitrogen. So I release five back in the soil as NH4. Now, the key here is it isn't just carbon to nitrogen. It is carbon to phosphate, carbon to potassium, carbon to calcium, carbon to magnesium, and carbon to all of your trace minerals. And so what happens is bacteria being the most nutrient dense get consumed by a protozoa who needs far less of what is in the bacteria so the balance gets released as a soluble nutrient for the plant. And so the plant biology interaction is plants photosynthesize, they put out root exudates, and you have this attraction by the biology into the roots to get the energy. And so if you're a hungry protozoa, you simply go where the bacteria are at the buffet table. It's very simple. And as you eat and release, eat and release, there's this massive amount of nutrition. So an active protozoa can eat up to 10,000 bacteria in a day. That's a tremendous amount of nitrogen and phos and potassium, calcium release if the system is functional. And nematode do the same thing to fungi. Their primary food is fungal organisms. And so you have the same process of 20 to one to 100 to one, where you're releasing the excess nutrition. The magic about how the system continues to work is that bacteria and fungi can out reproduce at a much accelerated rate than the rate of protozoa and nematode can eat them. And so this is a process of having the natural systems in nature provide our plant nutrition versus us buying it synthetically in the wrong form. Health results from food with superior nutrition that supports our, intel our intelligent genetic design of your body and your met metabolist system. Disease comes from poor quality food that destroys the cellular structure, the genetic design and our metabolic system within our body. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. There is only one correct way to support your metabolic system. And there are many, many ways to destroy it. And so we're going to go back and forth here between, between what's happening to humans and what's happening to fields. And so as you look at this, this is one of our farms that we had dealt with in near Billings, Montana. And these are the sunflowers that they had grown for 20 years. 
This is normal dry land sunflower crop in Montana. Now, approximately 100 feet away, we brought in some biological properties and some biological products that stabilized and neutralized a lot of the toxic effects of the fertilizer. And consequently, we used a lot less fertilizer here. Now, this is the same seed, same field, same year. Their pictures are 100 feet apart. And so you only need the plant to tell you what the genetic expression is when it gets the right or a superior form of nutrition. Now, I will tell you, this is not, this is not the end potential of this crop. This is in Northern Utah. We had corn silage, 15 and a half feet tall, 35 ton to the acre. Most of the neighboring crops were about eight to nine feet tall. From Jamie in Georgia, this pretty good sized turnip. When you put it on a scale, we're just under eight pounds. And Jamie sent some of these turnips to me and they're actually very, very good and they were not fibrous. From Northern Utah, our farmer brought this in. Different fields that he used biological seed treatments with biological products on and the others that he didn't. And so of the three fields, you can definitely see the plant response. One from Augusta, Montana. The farmer picked these plants, sent us the pictures. Again, in Montana, wheat heads. One with way more biological and mineral and reduced fertilizer versus the other one. In Idaho, biologicals with fertilizer, we produce 16 uniform sized potatoes. The other side, was four or five potatoes of various sizes. And our first 10 ton or more alfalfa crop we finally accomplished in Nevada with the biologicals with the, as part of the nutritional program. It took us three years to do this, but we finally got it there. This is a wonderful friend and associate of mine. This is Len Horst up in Squim, Washington. And he and his wife, Wanda, run a garden center. So you can take a look at his garden peas on the left and his strawberries on the right. These are a little bit better than normal. One of their gardeners dropped off a sick tomato. Wanda saved it. She put it in Len's potting soil with his microbial mineral tea. And the microorganism complex he uses, plant turned into a marvelous, marvelous tomato. Here's some of Len's strawberries. Again, just in a pot on a 55-gallon drum beautiful plants. There's my wife in her garden and my dad from his garden. These are just vegetables. These are critically important in our maintaining our health because they're whole foods, they're natural foods. They're not processed, they're not synthetic. And last but not least here is the importance of biology. Is, and we've got about 10 minutes, 10 or 12 minutes. We're good. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're almost good. done, Jared. Right on. What's happening here is father is Lyman, or excuse me, the father is Ivan and Lyman is the son. When I started going back to Georgia and working with the farms there, this was a farm manager for one of our growers. And he, his son, Lion was on the autistic spectrum. He didn't speak much. He was very reserved, very shy, didn't interact. He was just beginning to go to school, but he was very reclusive. 
And so they asked, what, what can we do for him? We've had him to doctors. We've got him on medication and nothing that's working. And I said, look, why don't we simply start with trying to rearrange his gut microflora? Now, there's a whole magnificent study. And I know the Steve, the gentleman before us, talked briefly about this with um, Natasha Campbell's work. And so there's been immense amount of work coming out on this. But when you look at this, we gave this young man a simple probiotic. And that was in the that was in the spring of the year. By fall, this young man was speaking two fluent languages and he was into everything his father did, everything. His school teacher couldn't believe it was the same kid. They had been to years with doctors, years on medication, and for and for the price of probably twenty dollars of gut microflora, we've completely changed this little guy's life. And this is why we do what we do. So when you look at this, in our systems, health is whole, natural, and unprocessed. These are carbohydrates, fat, fats, and proteins, but they're the right kind. And we get to build and regenerate from the natural whole foods that we should be eating. On the other hand, if you want to promote disease, you go through the unnatural, the unprocessed, and the industrialized. And it will create all kinds of metabolic dysfunctions and problems. And the same thing is identically true with our soils and with our livestock, is you can take and have the plants and the life respond to the whole natural mineral and biological inputs, or we can go with the NPK concepts, a lot of high chemical input, and the these chemical residues that do not leave. And here's an example of some of our fields in the Midwest. This is corn. At the same time, one field to the other field, these are only several hundred feet apart. And this is October 1st. One is completely dead and one is still alive and growing. And this is the yield. Corn field right to the tip and over and of the diseased plant, which was infected with Goss's wilt because of its genetics and its nutrition. The ear is approximately half the size and the plant is dead inside. It rotted internally. So Jared, that's the concepts that we want to present. And so that is the basis of what we do. Thank you so much, Ken. But how do we get a hold of you with a good website, Ken? Hey, the simplest one is bmted.com. Or you can look us up at Biominerals Technologies. And the one thing that we're embarking on that I hadn't mentioned to you in depth yet, Gerald, Jared, is we're putting together a, an extensive series on human health and soil plant nutrition density. And the series is called Food for Life. And that there's a link to it on our website. It is all free. And so we're going to go into an extensive array of human health and disease issues and how they actually get generated and they get sponsored by us eating the wrong things and having the wrong things in our diets. But then also the parallel pro program is the same thing with our soil nutrition. Those things that should be going into that soil to provide that biological life, which is the intelligent communication between it 
plant. So, so that is forthcoming. We're just starting that series. It's called Food for Life. It is free. People can view it simply by going to our website and clicking on there. And every time we add a new video, it will notify people that it's there to view. The and it's also on the YouTube channel. So Biominerals Technologies has a YouTube channel. And if you don't have that, I can send you the link to that. And again, all this information is free. We put it out there because we want to help everyone in their management of their soils, their livestock, and their selves and their family's nutrition.